Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Today is the 26th of February, 2014, and we are continuing to keep track of the unfolding events in Ukraine. And anyone who has been attempting to keep track of what's happening there uh, basically knows you have to be up on it in, on an hourly basis to find the latest developments. But we are, of course, watching the disintegration of any sort of normality in Ukraine, and the, ch the, uh, the chips are still very much in the air and yet to come down on the table in any particular discernible pattern, or perhaps they have. And in order to help us discern that pattern, we are now talking to William Engdahl. Of course, he has been a previous guest on the Corbett Report, so I certainly hope that uh, that listeners and viewers will have seen his work before. If not, please go to williamengdahl.com, where you can find all of his articles and links to his books and other works. Um, at William Engdahl a huge source of information on all matters geopolitics, so it is great to have you here to pick your brain on matters related to Ukraine, and I'd like to use as the starting point of this conversation a an op-ed that you wrote uh, late last month that appeared on RT under the title uh, US-EU Meddling in Ukraine Battle, and in that you noted that Washington and the EU uh, agenda seems to be, quote, to force an immediate end to the elected Yanukovych government in Kiev and lock Ukraine into the EU and ultimately NATO. Uh, Washington's agenda has little to do with democracy and freedom and a lot to do with destabilizing Putin's Russia. And, uh, and I think that as we stand here nearly a month out from the time in which you penned those words, uh, they really have seemed to have come true in a lot of different ways. So let's talk about that agenda. How do we know that there is an EU-US agenda at play here? And how do we know that there are linkages to what's happening in the Ukraine right now? Well, we, after I wrote that article, uh, we have the uh, publication on YouTube of the extraordinary uh, open telephone discussion between Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and uh, the ambassador in Kiev, her ambassador, uh, Payet. And this was a phone call made while she was in Kiev uh, in early February, where she literally talked person by person who the U.S., who Washington, who Victoria Nuland, and her faction anyway, uh, were going to place in the government as as they had forced uh, Yanushenko to make a compromise and, and agree, even before the elections next year, agree to a uh, coalition of opposition as well as uh, his own party uh, as a compromise. And they said, for example, Klitschko, we want, I want on the outside uh, and the, the uh, Svoboda, the, this neo-Nazi uh, right-wing party that got a huge amount of votes in the last election, I uh, want them on the outside, and uh, let's have uh, uh, Julia Timoshenko's uh, man on the inside uh, as as prime minister and uh, and so forth, uh, because he has more international credibility. And then she, in the uh, video, this uh, famous statement of hers with eloquent English, uh, she said, "Fuck the EU. Uh, they want Klitschko in there, and you know, and so forth." So it became very clear this was a direct U.S. State Department coup d'état instrumentalizing to the person who they were going to do bring in to to uh, uh, oust a democratically elected in an election which western election monitors uh, claimed was relatively fraud free so uh, yanukovych because people were fed up with the uh, the previous government of of uh, uh, yushenko this was the pro nato government uh, they voted Yanukovych because they felt uh, maybe they would get a little bit uh, better situation under him. So this was an elected government. The U.S. comes in and says, we don't like what you do, so we're going to change you by uh, uh, by our, essentially our color revolution part two. And that's what we see. To play devil's advocate with your interpretation of that conversation, given that this is the Assistant Secretary of State talking to the U.S. Ambassador to the Ukraine, what else would we be expecting them to be discussing in a situation like this, other than the players that they would be advocating for to get into the the, the government once the, the changeover takes place? I mean, obviously, the U.S. would have a position on who they would want to see there. Maybe they were just discussing it in a in that sort of aspirational way rather than an operational way. Well, that's what they tried to... Uh, give as an impression to, to cover their tracks. But uh, in reality, if you listen to the YouTube uh, conversation in full, there are shorter versions on the web. But if you listen to the full version, it's very clear. This is the U.S. dictating what the, the shape of the new government down to the person is going to be. And this is 
interference in a sovereign nation, even if you, if uh, Washington doesn't like the policy. Can you imagine if Putin came in and started dictating uh, to, I don't know, uh, Vice President Biden or uh, the Russian ambassador in, in Washington, who they wanted to uh, come in and, and uh, be vice president and secretary of defense and so forth uh, in the United States government after they'd financed uh, a uh, so-called color revolution on the streets of the United States with students and millions of unemployed and so forth marching against Washington. And uh, that were to become public. Uh, that wouldn't go down very well among uh, uh, the U.S. population, I don't think. So this is, uh, governments, uh, this is illegal what, what, uh, what the U.S. has done. It's illegal what uh, Sikorsky, the foreign minister of, of Ukraine, has done, uh, what, what John McCain has done going to Kiev uh, with the uh, International Republican Institute. He's the chairman of it, which is a uh, regime change NGO created uh, on a plan from CIA head Bill Casey during the Reagan era. So uh, these are not nice people. Victoria Newland herself is a real piece of work uh, by all her public credentials. She started out as a uh, an aide to Dick Cheney, who was one of the most democratically uh, unfond people that I can recall in recent history, uh, to put it uh, gently. And then she went from Dick Cheney to become a U.S. ambassador to NATO. At the time, NATO was was expanding into uh, the Warsaw Pact countries, the former communist countries of the Soviet era. So uh, Victoria Newland, she's married to one of the leading neoconservatives in Washington, and she herself is a neocon. So uh, this is a distinct network. They're tied to the U.S. military industry very intimately uh, in various foundation boards and and so forth. <coughs> and uh, this is this is not an innocent support of uh, destroying a democratically elected regime. Just before we leave the specific issue of the Newland phone call, I think um, perhaps the, the fact that they are discussing this in great detail is not particularly surprising. It is egregious, but not surprising. But what is surprising to me about that phone call is that we have that recording. Where did that come from? Well, I give credit to the Ukrainian uh, NSA that they can at least be as clever as the U.S. NSA in terms of uh, electronic eavesdropping. Uh, it doesn't have to be from Putin. Uh, of course, uh, Newland's office immediately issued a press release blaming Putin for it without any presentation of evidence. Uh, so they're trying to, uh, you know, turn it to their advantage, uh, disadvantage to their advantage. But uh, the thing was quickly covered up through a spin doctoring in, in Washington, and, and uh, they went ahead with their coup. Well, let's talk more about the composition of those protesters. And you did allude to it earlier, talking about students and unemployed. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about who actually has been involved in this coup, where they came from, where the funding for this came from, and where the organizational strategies for this were, were being derived from. I have a number of friends, uh, ordinary Ukrainians, uh, Russians too, uh, in Ukraine, in all parts of Ukraine, who uh, have kept me informed as this developed since last November. They said that most Ukrainians st have stayed in their house. They don't want any, you know, they want to work. They want to survive. They, the country is a corrupt country. Uh, corruption is endemic. That's well known. Yanukovych, uh, uh, Yushchenko, uh, Timoshenko, they're all corrupt. But uh, uh, the bands of, of protesters were brought in from eastern, uh, western Ukraine, excuse me, western Ukraine, which is historically uh, had been a part of Poland, had been a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, before World War I, and uh, was culturally uh, oriented toward western Europe, toward Poland. That's one reason I think that the uh, uh, foreign secretary of the Polish government, uh, uh, Sikorsky has played such an active interventionary role in in fomenting this this protest uh, since the beginning, on on behalf of the EU, but uh, not uniformly on behalf of the EU. So uh, what happened, according to uh, people that I've talked with on this, what happened is that the uh, unemployed students and and uh, or students and the unemployed were offered money 
And if you're unemployed in Ukraine, your life conditions are pretty miserable. They're offered money to be bussed in from, from Western Ukraine and elsewhere into Kiev before Christmas and build up this, this kind of fortress uh, occupation of the capital city. Uh, then the security to guard the protesters from the police was provided by agreement of the three opposition parties, was provided by an organization of neo-Nazis called Pravi Sector, right sector. Uh, they have a long history, it's a specific history. And they used weapons, not only uh, firearms, guns and so forth, but uh, they used Molotov cocktails, they used laser weapons, uh, sophisticated stuff and very deadly stuff to not just guard the protesters from uh, police, riot police uh, control, but when the thing really turned bloody in the, uh, uh, in the early days of February, the end, end of uh, January, uh, with people getting killed and so forth, that was the work of the uh, Pravi sector protesters. And they deliberately, I think, escalated the thing to create this impression that everything's out of control, to panic Yanukovych and the government into a deal. And uh, who financed that is very difficult to find out. But the fact that the International Republican Institute, an arm of the National Endowment for Democracy, people can look that up and look up the history of it, was created in the 80s to literally, quote, do what the CIA used to do but uh, privately. So uh, this is John McCain. He's the chairman of the Republican arm of that. And the various U.S. NGOs have been all over Ukraine ever since uh, Yushchenko's election in 2004 as a pro-NATO candidate. So that's something that Yanukovych was perhaps naive about, blindsided. Uh, in my estimation, were I president of Ukraine, I would immediately do something similar to what Putin did in Russia and declare all foreign NGOs to be foreign agents, an agent means an actor, it doesn't necessarily mean CIA agent, and require a transparency of where their funds come from, how they're dispersed, and so forth. Uh, I have no indication that that was done, and I think that's where he was blindsided. So groups like Otpor, which is now called Canvas, that are in Belgrade, who train cadre for these uh, swarming uh, or Twitter revolutions, uh, like in Tahrir Square in Egypt and uh, uh, virtually every color revolution uh, since 2000, uh, they, their textbooks were translated into Ukrainian language, and they were identical to the English language textbooks of the Albert Einstein ins Institution of, of uh, Gene Sharp and uh, the textbooks that were used in Tahrir Square. Well, it is uh, interesting to look at the way that this has played out, especially with reference to those uh, right-wing nationalist neo-Nazi groups that you, that you talk about. And I wonder, it, given that this does at least play into an US-EU agenda, if not is actually being dictated word for word by them, um, to what extent they want to be uh, involved with these groups right now? Or are, is this just a, an alliance of convenience? How, how does that situation play out? That is unclear. I had a long discussion uh, last evening with, with a Russian friend who is constantly in contact with people across the Ukraine, ordinary uh, people. What's happened now, immediately after the uh, collapse of the uh, uh, Yushchenko government, or not Yushchenko, uh, Yanukovych yeah. government, uh, and his flight from, from Kiev, they began taking these, these rioters uh, in busloads and bringing them down to the Crimean. The Crimean is the site of a vital Russian naval base by treaty agreement with Ukraine going into 1919. They have uh, an agreement to base the Russian Navy there, or parts of the Navy. And so they immediately were redeployed to start riots in C Crimea. The citizens of Crimea want no part of this. They're largely Russian-speaking. They're, they're uh, Russian origin, ethnically, and so forth. And they immediately took down, when, when the, uh, the government toppled, they took down the Ukrainian flag and raised the Russian flag. And they came out on the streets and fought with these thugs, these hooligans that were brought in, 
uh, and said, you go back home, we don't want anything of your riots and protests here. And uh, Putin now has redeployed, I've, I've understood, uh, just since yesterday, redeployed the uh, military that was brought in to make the Sochi Olympics uh, peaceful, which he did. Uh, they've been redeployed to uh, the Crimea uh, for security to defend the fleet. So it has the potential of uh, getting very nasty. I think uh, a large part of the eastern Ukraine wants secession from the western Ukraine. Western Ukraine uh, is not interesting for the European Union because uh, it has virtually no industry. It has a lot of trees, a lot of forests. Uh, it has this history of being part of Poland, part of Austro-Hungary, as I mentioned. But uh, it's not the heart of Ukraine. Europe and the West wants to uh, take the eastern part which is where the Russian influence is strongest, where Yanukovych's origins are and where his base is. So I think it's not to be ruled out that there is a civil war in Ukraine in the next months and that there is a split into two countries, one going toward uh, Russia and the Eurasian Union and the other, uh, maybe like uh, southern Sudan, the uh, Republic of Eastern Ukraine and the... Uh, People's Democratic Republic of Western Ukraine or something like that. I don't know. Right. Well, that that is certainly interesting to contemplate. And it does seem to be that there is this this deep split uh, through through the country. And it is divided along um, linguistic lines, as you point out, mostly in the eastern and southern areas. They're, they're Russian speaking and, uh, and obviously yeah. aligned with that. Uh, excuse me, James. All of them are Russian speaking. And what, what the new government has done in, in Kiev, this, this Putsch government has outlawed the use of the Russian language in, in all Ukraine. I mean, this, uh, this does not bode well for uh, any kind of democracy. It certainly does, again, suggest that there is that uh, split that is taking place and will probably only deepen if this continues. But, um, but of course, you raised the specter of Russian military involvement um, and, there, of course, their naval assets deployed, deployed in the Black Sea there. Um, this is an important part of all of this, and obviously... I think that uh, Putin is the one with the most to to lose potentially in in this. So, so would be the one that would be most vociferous in defending uh, his sort of um, sphere of hegemony in the area. I suppose. Um, do you think that the Western uh, power block, U.S., e EU, NATO, would push this to a military confrontation? I don't think the EU would. I think the uh, if you go back uh, approximately one week, uh, Steinmeier the uh, from Germany, came into Kiev and largely brokered a compromise deal, which on the surface was, I think, reasonable under the circumstances. That was to have early elections in December of this year so that all parties would have time to prepare and campaign and get their acts together. Uh, and in the meantime, the opposition would be brought into a coalition government, uh, uh, the uh, Klitschko would be offered deputy prime minister post, uh, uh, etc. And uh, Yanukovych agreed to repeal the, uh, the anti-riot legislative acts that were passed, emergency acts, and release the, uh, the rioters who were put in jail without, uh, you know, without penalty. Uh, all of this he did, including releasing Julia Timoshenko, who immediately uh, proclaimed herself the queen of Ukraine. Uh, to the annoyance of, of many Ukrainians who were a little bit fed up with her uh, antics. But uh, so it's, it's a, uh, then literally, I think uh, less than a day after this agreement was publicly announced, with Klitschko being part of it, riots broke out, all hell broke loose, and everything became a shambles. And I think this was the way that Victoria Newland. Uh, told the European Union, fuck the EU. They destroyed the thing through covert means. That's a supposition on my part. It's my impression from the sequence of events and everything we know. Uh, it would be interesting if some people out in your listening audience uh, uh, were able to document and, and demonstrate that. But the, the timing sequence is such that it suggests nothing other than that. 
Very interesting. Well, let's step back for a moment because we've mentioned, of course, Yushchenko and Timoshenko here a couple of times, but people might not remember the Orange Revolution in two, of 2004 in any great detail or what transpired after that, which I think is also quite interesting. And eventually the uh, the, uh, the imprisonment of Timoshenko and the ouster of uh, Yushchenko. Let's talk about that history and how that plays into the current situation. Sure. Uh, beginning around, well, beginning well before 2003, but uh, Ukraine had uh, been governed or, or uh, ruled over by old holdovers from the Soviet system. Uh, corrupt, yes, uh, very many things. But then, uh, of course, the population was, was hoping for a better future when the communism ended and uh, uh, the austerity of the Soviet era was behind them and they went for the market reforms, shock therapy and whatever. So U.S. NGOs like Freedom House, like National Endowment for Democracy and their spinoffs, uh, began working inside Ukraine. The U.S. government spent uh, hundreds of millions, uh, perhaps billions of dollars uh, in Ukraine uh, to foster organized opposition and uh, to foster a so-called Orange Revolution. The cadre who pulled off the street demonstrations of the Orange Revolution of uh, Yushchenko's party, were trained by Canvas, uh, the organization that uh, was trained and financed by the U.S. State Department, the uh, U.S. government, to create the uh, ouster of Milosevic in, in uh, Yugoslavia in 2000, the first successful color revolution of the modern genre. So... The, I spoke with a journalist who was in Kiev during the protests uh, claiming that the election had been fraudulent and that Yushchenko had won. Uh, he said that CNN was in place in one area where there was to be a mass protest against uh, the election uh, back in 03-04. CNN was in place with a giant camera on rail tracks these things take a, at least a half a day to assemble. They're, they're huge installations so that you could zoom in on the crowd and then zoom right back out and create these dramatic visual effects. He saw that in place before the demonstrators had arrived uh, at this particular square in, in Kiev. So CNN, which has a, a track record of being very intimate with Washington, uh, seems to have gotten an advance word of where this thing was going to go and where the protesters would appear. Uh, be that as it may, the, the, the wife then of Yushchenko was, was a former Reagan administration official, uh, an American citizen when he, was, uh, when he became president, let's not say elected. And Yushchenko's program included EU application for membership for Ukraine and membership in NATO. So Yushchenko was supported by the entire uh, uh, neoconservative apparatus of Washington and the Pentagon and State Department as well. Once he got into office in a coalition with uh, Timoshenko, uh, he continued the plundering of Ukraine, but perhaps in a more extravagant fashion than his predecessor. The corruption uh, became horrendous, such that uh, the promised results of the Orange Revolution uh, were completely more than disappointing to the average Ukrainian. So the conditions for his uh, defeat were being uh, laid, and especially after Ukraine's role in uh, helping Georgia, uh, Saakashvili, another State Department uh, creation in Georgia, a neighboring state of Georgia, to uh, prepare the retaking of, of South Ossetia from, from Russia, or from, from an autonomous uh, neutral entity. And uh, after that, uh, Ukraine's, Yushchenko's days were numbered. Uh, Yanukovych won the election uh, shortly after all of this. And I think it was in 2010. And uh, immediately charges against uh, Julia Timoshenko for corruption uh, were pressed and she was put in prison. People said it was because she was his most... Uh, formidable electoral rival, but the background of Yulia Timoshenko is certainly 
not surrounded with uh, sterling characters. One of her closest intimates uh, sits in an American prison for financial fraud and the billions of dollars uh, connected with various contracts that U.S. companies and others did with Ukraine. So uh, essentially, Yanukovych won on the discontent with the Orange Revolution. And that, of course, plays into what we're experiencing today. And as I think that draws out, this is part of a much longer term and broader agenda that has been at play for many, many years now to try to draw Ukraine into the EU, into NATO membership. And uh, I think we see this taking place in a number of different fronts, not, of course, simply directed in the Ukraine. Of course, this is obviously directed at the encirclement of Russia. And on that note, I noticed that you also have recently penned an op-ed at RT.com, U.S. Missile Shield, Russian Bear Sleeping with One Eye Open, talking, of course, about the ever-encroaching U.S. missile, quote-unquote, shield that is uh, obviously not built uh, to to counter the Iranian threat, quote-unquote, is clearly directed directed at Russia. Let's talk about how that plays into sort of what we're experiencing in the microcosm in Ukraine. Well, since the collapse of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, U.S., and through that NATO, uh, have never deviated from the idea of destroying entirely the military capability of what was left of the Soviet Union in terms of Russia. And they brought in IMF shock therapy. The the, uh, G7 meeting in Houston, Texas in June of 1990, James Baker, Secretary of State, presented the U.S. demand that all economic transformation of former uh, East Bloc countries in Soviet Union, Russia, be controlled by the International Monetary Fund. That meant shock therapy, immediate privatization, ending of government subsidies as rapidly as possible, selling off the crown jewels of these uh, state economies, was what they were under communism, and especially of the oil and gas uh, companies of Russia. Well, uh, Yeltsin was the man of Washington. Uh, They put him in there by uh, all evidence that's come out since then. And they managed to ensure that he had a lifelong supply of vodka at hand so that uh, he would be in a constant drunken stupor while he sold out his countrymen. And those Yeltsin years were absolutely living hell for most ordinary Russians. Their pensions disappeared. Uh, They had to create their own gardens to literally survive. Millions of Russians uh, became terminally ill and died off. Uh, It was really a catastrophe. Uh, The military side of it was, despite the promise of James Baker III to Andropov, who was then uh, the uh, commanding figure in the Soviet Union, uh, that there would be a quid pro quo in exchange for East Germany becoming part of West Germany and non uh, 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 that, that uh, NATO would not extend to the East, not extend to Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, Uh, Czech Republic or then Czechoslovakia, and certainly not to Ukraine or or, uh, Georgia and so the perimeter of Russia. Well, by 2002-2003, that was being massively violated. The U.S. military industry was part of various NGOs that were lobbying for NATO's eastward expansion, and they were quite successful in, in doing that. Then uh, Don Rumsfeld came up with the missile defense idea, which Putin very rightly said uh, at a a strategic conference in Munich uh, shortly after, that this, uh, the argument that this is to defend against rogue missile attacks on the United States from from Iran or North Korea is a little bit like taking your right arm to scratch your left ear. Uh, It's not the way you would make a missile defense by putting uh, nuclear missiles in Poland. Uh, to get at Iran. In fact, Putin said, Russia offers uh, sharing of our basing rights for radar installations in Azerbaijan, right on the border to Iran, if Iran is the real threat. Well, the Obama, uh, well, the uh, Bush administration uh, completely stonewalled and ignored that uh, that had ever been made. But uh, that called the bluff of the United States uh, that this was something about Iran. U.S. military experts, U.S. missile defense experts, uh, such as Robert Bowman, uh, Colonel Robert Bowman, who's head of Reagan's Star Wars missile defense uh, program, 
uh, said in an interview I made shortly before his death, missile defense is the missing link to nuclear primacy, ability to carry off a nuclear first strike without any fear of nuclear counterstrike from, from your enemy. And if, uh, if that is given to the United States, now they have missile defense in Poland, they have missile defense in Turkey, they have missile defense in Bulgaria, and they just uh, brought an advanced uh, ballistic missile uh, shield destroyer to Rota, Spain, where, where they have a naval base as one of four such ships that will also be a part of this encirclement uh, of Russia uh, in terms of nuclear first strike. Now, we're not, we're not joking around with some little, uh, uh, you know, cruise missile attacks in Pakistan or Afghanistan uh, with, with drones or whatever. This is, we're talking about playing around with a Russian roulette version of nuclear obliteration of, of the planet. Because the closer the U.S. gets to that, to, to uh, enclosing the nuclear defensive shield, which is not defensive, but offensive in the extreme, the closer that uh, the Pentagon, NATO gets to that, and it's a U.S. program, NATO has no say in the matter, uh, the closer we get to a preemptive strike from the side of the Russians. And once that happens, all bets are off. So this is madness uh, cubed, madness to the 10th degree uh, that uh, Washington is, is embarking on. I think few people have a clue how dangerous this is because there's no public open debate. There's absolutely zero debate that I've seen in, in mainstream U.S. Western media about the uh, other side, the dark side of the so-called ballistic missile defense, BMD, of, of Washington. You know, as my, myself, as someone who has watched this being slotted into place and seen the different pieces as they float across the news wires of this story, uh, it's one thing to see that on a, on a kind of a, a day-in, day-out basis, but to have someone put it together like that, it really did send a shiver up my spine because I, I truly do understand just how very precarious all of this is and where this trends. And of course, we are sitting here on the centenary of uh, the beginning of World War One, and a lot of people are beginning to wonder if the similar types of events are, are about to play out here in 2014. Um, still very worrying signs uh, taking shape. And as you say, Ukraine still um, on the cusp of potentially civil war. So still lots of uh, developments that I'm sure we'll be following. Um, I want to wrench this conversation in a completely different way very abruptly. But before we do so, is there anything else that you'd like to add with regards to the Ukraine situation? Well, I think uh, when all circumstances are considered, the uh, Putin and Lavrov team have shown remarkable restraint in, in the situation. I think the, uh, the financial uh, support that Russia promised of the $15 billion purchase of Ukrainian bonds when things were, were uh, relatively more stable and uh, when uh, Yanukovych was still president, uh, that has been put on indefinite hold pending what comes out as a coalition government now. I think that's uh, the right decision to make. And uh, if that coalition government continues as it seems to be uh, going in a Western orchestra orchestrated direction, and uh, we can be sure that uh, they're getting direct telephone signals uh, from people in and around Victoria Newland's office on a minute by minute basis at this point, uh, then I anticipate a situation where there will be no bailout money forthcoming for Ukraine from Russia. The European Union, if they were to now tell the voters of Europe, we're going to give uh, 25 to 30 billion uh, uh, euros in purchases of Ukrainian government bonds to help stabilize Ukraine, there would be a Ukraine-style mass revolt on the streets of uh, docile Germany and uh, many other Western European countries because the European Union uh, is in its own uh, existential crisis with Poland, uh, with, not, sorry, not with Poland, with Greece, with Portugal, with Italy, and now France is starting to look very shaky along with Holland. So the idea of more taxpayer bailouts to bail out now Ukraine, because the EU government had been a party to the uh, toppling of an elected government in Ukraine and now wants to clean up the mess, that is not going to happen. It's certainly not the United States government with the uh, fiscal restraints that they're under. They're not going to step in. 
So it really creates an interesting situation. There's always the There's IMF. Always. <laughs> oh, no, there isn't the IMF either. Well, you know, um, it's uh, all part of swirling around that Washington consensus. All right. Yeah, let's... The, I, the IMF is going to come into the new Ukraine constellation. Uh, that's, that's very clear. But uh, what they're going to offer in terms of, of the requirements of Ukraine this is a uh, drop in the ocean. All right. Uh, as I say, I want to switch this conversation to something else because there's another geopolitical uh, event that's been bubbling under the surface for a long time and seems to be some some moves are happening on the geopolitical table right now. And I'd like to get your take on this um, because I know that you, you keep a close eye on these types of events. This is something that I've been noticing for at least a year or two. It seems the gloves have been coming off um, with regards to U.S. treatment of Saudi Arabia. And this has been happening in a lot of subtle cultural uh, ways that certain, certain boundaries and lines that were not uh, crossed before are suddenly being crossed in mainstream American media so that uh, criticism of the Saudi regime is now being acceptable, really, in, in uh, for example, CFR Globalist Insider Fareed Zakaria's program. He's always uh, uh, drawing attention to what's happening in Saudi Arabia, etc. So I've been noticing this for some time. And then we saw in late last year, we saw some interesting moves happening around the, uh, the 9-11 slash Saudi connection. And we had Senator Bob Graham come out talking about uh, the redacted pages from the congressional investigation, which have been there since 2002 or whenever that uh, that report came out. And I think it was an open secret that it were related to the Saudis, but now it's suddenly people can talk about it and it's now a political issue. And we just had a court decision that is finally allowing uh, the 9-11 victims' families to sue the Saudis in court. So we're seeing some very interesting moves that clearly are related to a destabilization in the U.S.-Saudi relationship. We saw the Saudis rejecting the U.N., um, uh, the seat at the Security Council that they had been lobbying for, and other bizarre moves happening on the table. I would love to get your take on what is happening right now. Why is this rift uh, happening, and, and is this something that is going to continue to widen, or is this just a momentary blip? Oh, uh, it's no momentary blip. The I'm just finishing a new book uh, on, on uh, aspects of this problem. And that is the uh, weaponization of political Islam by Western governments, the British government, the uh, U.S. government after, after the Second World War, step by step more so. The Obama administration, uh, people, advisors around Obama, uh, had developed a strategy to, which ultimately was called the Arab Spring. It's no spring, but the strategy was to use an organization, a very secretive organization with many faces, called the Muslim Brotherhood, to create regime change throughout the Islamic world. And it's part of a strategy that goes back to the days of uh, George W. Bush and even, even before, called the Greater Middle East Project, uh, goes well back more than a decade. And that is to transform the political map of, of the Middle East. And Obama's uh, choice was to use the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, up until the Syrian war, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudis had a, let's call it an uneasy truce. But uh, increasingly, the Saudi monarchy, after the events in Bahrain, the street protests by Shiites against the uh, minority Sunni government, Saudis are Wahhabite Sunnis, the, the major split, as many of your listeners will know, in the Islamic world is between a vast majority who are Sunni strain of Islam and a minority, Iran, 60% uh, or so of Iraq and uh, large parts of Syria, which are Alawite. Uh, that's a spinoff of Shia. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is uh, from the Alawite uh, strain of Islam. And the Saudis gave uh, succor, let's call it that, to a young man from an extremely wealthy Saudi family that was involved in royal construction called the Bin Laden Construction Company, the Bin Laden family. And a 20-some-year-old uh, member of the family was a uh, uh, jihadist uh, Islam, political Islam, uh, who had been trained by various members of the Muslim Brotherhood for, who'd come over from Egypt. And he was sent by Prince uh, Turkey, Al-Faisal, the head of Saudi intelligence, back in 1979 to a place called Afghanistan, where he was sent to Pakistan on the border with Afghanistan. 
to prepare the jihad against the uh, provoked Soviet occupation uh, of Afghanistan in December 1979. Jimmy Carter had signed a secret uh, national security memorandum authorizing a covert operation called Operation Cyclone to train and arm jihad Muslims. They called them the Mujahideen, if people remember back in the 80s. And Osama bin Laden was sent in there to set up a services bureau on the border of Afghanistan in Pakistan. He was supported by Saudi intelligence funds, by Pakistani intelligence fund, the ISI, and by the CIA. And that created the jihad against the Soviet Union that took 10 years uh, and many, many dead lives, Afghani dead lives, uh, toward a victory for the Mujahideen. And that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were simply unable to continue. Uh, now, the first of all, let me be blunt. The idea that 19... Uh, fanatical Arabs with virtually no professional skills as pilots of modern commercial jet airliners armed with such terrifying weapons as carton box cutters could hijack four commercial jetliners in one day and divert their course undetected for 93 minutes before the first scramble of a NORAD uh, jet interceptor in the air, uh, the likelihood that 19 Arabs, most of whom, 14 of whom were said to be Saudi citizens, uh, that they could do that and do what was done to the three towers of the World Trade Center as well as to the Pentagon. The plausibility of that, I personally believe is less than zero. So the idea that the 9-11 uh, report has all this damning evidence of uh, Saudi involvement and so forth, uh, let's see the full report. Let's see what, what the uh, evidence is uh, on that regard. So I don't want to get into a whole who shot John in terms of the tragedy of 9-11. But the point is, uh, of your question is, what is with the Saudi-U.S. relationship? Well, what's happened is Events in Syria, where the Muslim Brotherhood was clearly the choice of Washington to become the leadership of the opposition to the government. The Muslim Brotherhood with Morsi in Egypt, Mubarak had a very stable, long-term, deep relationship of trust, whatever Mubarak's flaws were, were uh, with the Saudi monarchy. And the Saudi monarchy warned the U.S. against toppling Mubarak because of what would come if the Muslim Brotherhood were to take power. Uh, so the, the cleft between Washington and, and uh, Riyadh and Saudi Arabia began widening. Actually, it began widening with the decision to topple Saddam Hussein in 2003 by, by Washington, by the Bush administration. The Saudis again warned against that for creating instability across the, the Middle East and for bringing the Shia into power, which it did. The al-Maliki government is a Shia government. Uh, they're not entirely puppets of Iran, but the events in Syria have drawn Iran and his uh, majority government closer together as, as well as out of Syria. So the Saudis began to really become alarmed. The uh, protests in Bahrain across the bridge from Saudi Arabia uh, scared the daylights out of them, I think. Uh, and they realized that the Saudi monarchy itself was threatened if the Muslim Brotherhood were to activate their sleeper cells across Saudi Arabia. So the leadership of the Brotherhood went to Qatar. And the Emir of Qatar financed the uh, uh, activities of the Muslim Brotherhood to topple the Assad regime, partly because of Qatar's interest in uh, monopolizing the gas fields of the Persian Gulf that they share with Iran and bringing that gas by pipeline through Syria into Turkey, a NATO member country, and on, on to the vast growing European gas market. And that's something that Bashar al-Assad point blank refused in 2009 when the Emir 
went to Damascus to uh, ask for that kind of an agreement. He said, no, our energy uh, partnership is with Russia and we will honor that. So that made him an enemy. And uh, when Syria and uh, Iraq and Iran in 2012 signed an agreement in, uh, I think it was February or March of 2012, to build an Iranian gas pipeline through Iran, through Iraq, and through Syria to the ports in the Mediterranean and on to Europe. Shortly after that, within a matter of days, uh, the jihad against uh, Bashar al-Assad as the new Adolf Hitler, uh, just like Milosevic was the new Adolf Hitler in the, the Yugoslav War, or Saddam Hussein became the new Adolf Hitler. They don't have many imaginative new names or images for for the uh, credible public, but uh, anyway, that that started the uh, full-scale jihad against uh, the Assad government in Syria. So this past summer, all evidence is that the uh, Obama had painted himself into a silly corner, in my estimation, a year earlier when he said, uh, trying to avoid uh, boots on the ground from from the Pentagon, from the U.S. Uh, as was the case in, in uh, Iraq. He wanted to exit his presidency as the one who wound down all these wars of the Bush era. Uh, he was painted into a corner last summer in August when uh, reports appeared in Arab media of chemical weapon attacks and blaming the Assad government for gassing its own people with uh, alleged use of sarin gas. Well, the newspaper that broke this to the world was a Saudi-owned, a government-owned Saudi newspaper. And journalists from Jordan went into the area north of Damascus where the gas attack uh, had taken place and interviewed families. And what they were told is that uh, Saudi military advisors to various uh, terrorist groups or whatever you want to call them, opposition, uh, that they had given these uh, jihadist groups, the weapons, without instructing them how to use them and uh, properly, because these are not toys that you're playing with, and that they had been, in other words, Prince Bandar, when he was put in charge of the Syrian dossier by the king, uh, used some pretty ugly means, apparently, to uh, try to get Obama to declare a shooting war against, against Syria, because nothing else had worked to date. And Obama was literally a hair's breadth away from that shooting war when Putin made his uh, diplomatic initiative to uh, mediate the extraction of those chemical weapons from government arsenals. And Bashar al-Assad accepted that immediately. That's what's in process now. And that allowed Obama a face-saving way out to what would have been potentially a catastrophic, not just a war in Syria, but a widening war that, that uh, would engulf Iran, would engulf uh, potentially Russia, and Lord knows what uh, disaster would have followed. Voices around President Obama, I've been told by people in, in and around Washington with direct access to some of those voices, uh, including the highest levels of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the uh, Defense Secretary's Office, were dead set against any such military intervention and were on the verge of resigning had Obama given the order. So there were fact there are factions inside Washington. There are deep factions inside that uh, are trying to avoid such uh, further military adventures. And uh, it's it's really a, a very complex situation. At that point, the Saudis took their marbles and ran away and said, uh, "We don't play ball with you." Also, they backed uh, the ouster by the Egyptian military of uh, Mohammed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood because uh, of their antipathy toward the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, they essentially forced regime change inside Qatar that the Emir transferred power to his son and got rid of the uh, foreign minister who was an advocate of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Syria and elsewhere. So it's a very complex thing uh, that's going on between Washington and also, it came out that Prince Bandar and the uh, Israeli government of Netanyahu had had secret uh, negotiations on strategy in, in uh, the Middle East uh, for some time. And it apparently dates back to Bandar's time, 23 years that he spent in Washington as Saudi ambassador and part-time uh, reported playboy. But uh, 
mainly that he had gotten close to APAC and various Israeli uh, government outlets uh, through that experience, and that there has been a kind of coordination on certain issues. So it's it's really a profound shift uh, since 1945 when Roosevelt and and the uh, Rockefeller Oil Group, Chevron and and Texaco and uh, Mobil and and uh, Exxon. Uh, more or less got the uh, the portfolio of the Saudi oil riches. Saudi Arabia has has been a firm ally of United States policy in return for U.S. military defense and other things. Uh, so the split is deep. If it can be mended, if uh, there are some reports that uh, Prince Bandar has not been seen in public for four weeks and rumors that he has been dumped by the king, if that's true or not, I haven't been able to confirm, but uh, were that to be the case, that would indicate an attempt at rapprochement on the part of uh, King Abdullah with, with the Obama administration. Uh, let's see how that unfolds. But the entire sequence of events that's been unleashed in the Middle East since the uh, beginning of the uh, so-called uh, Twitter revolution in Tunisia uh, and then spreading to Egypt and and on to uh, other countries in the region, virtually every country in the Arab Middle East. Uh, that uh, is now in a very, very pivotal phase where, where it could go one way or the other, and how it goes will affect uh, all of us profoundly. It, it certainly will. And I'm not sure if it was part of that narrative that you just painted there, but it is important to note that that independent journalistic investigation into the Gouda Syria chemical weapons attacks uh, also directly implicated uh, Bandar Bush as the one who yeah. supplied those weapons. I'm not sure if you right. noted that. but So yeah. yes, there, there are some very interesting developments. And I, I do see all of those points that you're talking about. But the one point that I can't fit into that is where what does this portend for the dollar? Because as I know you know very well, um, we've been living under the petrodollar regime for the last four decades, which has been the basis of the Saudi-U.S. Uh, relationship. And if that relationship goes, does the petrodollar not go with it? Well, the petrodollar really emerged after 1973 when Henry Kissinger and uh, David Rockefeller and others uh, uh, engineered what became the Yom Kippur War that triggered the uh, sanctions from the Saudi king and, and from Arab OPEC. Uh, to Rotterdam, to the European market of oil, and to uh, the U.S. That created a 400% spike in the price of oil. That uh, I go through in my book, A Century of War, Anglo-American Oil Politics. That was part of a uh, strategy by David Rockefeller's friends uh, in London and in New York, the banks and the oil companies, to... Uh, stop development and the independence of uh, West European developments with the developing world, the third world it was later called, by creating a massive increase in the price of oil, turning Arab OPEC countries into literally a dollar creation machine and recycling those petrodollars through the London banks, through the New York banks, in, into the world debt market and uh, through that dominating those markets. It's a, a complex story which shapes much much of the history of the 1980s up until the early 90s. That petrodollar underwent a transformation and became less a critical prop of the US dollar. Uh, what in the last years has been the main prop of the US dollar, uh, I would say the last 10 years, has been, uh, I wouldn't call it a petrodollar anymore so much as a mix between Commodity supported uh, demand for dollars combined with the U.S. as the sole military giant of the planet. They spend more on military hardware and defense than the other next 42 countries combined. Uh, that this gigantic military uh, machine that's been built up after the end of the Cold War, that that, uh, in effect, the dollar as reserve currency is backed up by Abrams tanks and F-16 F fighter jets. In other words, uh, countries like Japan, countries like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia who are defend dependent on U.S. military technology and others. So uh, either as defense or as actual hardware providers. So the, uh, the role of the petrodollar were Saudi Arabia and certain 
Saudi-allied uh, Arab Gulf countries to uh, do that, that would create a highly uh, challenging situation for the U.S. dollar. They could certainly do that. They could do it in uh, Chinese uh, renminbi, Chinese yuan. Uh, they could do it in uh, Japanese yen. They could do it in euros. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a really profound shift. And Israel, the Netanyahu government, but Israel in general, is in an equally profound epochal shift vis-a-vis -vis the special relationship with Washington of its own. So I know I was just recently in China and talked with some senior people there informally, and uh, one of them told me of an invitation to Tel Aviv uh, uh, by various uh, members of, of the government. This was two or three years ago. And they were literally begging the Chinese to open the door to Israel cooperation. Uh, the Chinese were very skeptical and apparently have not uh, opened the door as widely as some people in Tel Aviv would like. But in other words, seeking uh, other special relationship because Israel is a very powerful country, a very intelligent country, but a very small country and needs to either have a strategic Big Brother, such as France was in the 50s and the 60s, or uh, since the Yom Kippur War, or, or actually the 67 War, uh, Washington became that partner. So uh, the entire Middle East is essentially up for grabs, as I see it. And uh, it's, it's a very messy and a very dangerous situation. It's also one uh, rife with possibilities. I was talking with an Egyptian uh, two days ago, here in Germany, uh, who just came back from, from uh, visiting relatives in Egypt and goes uh, twice a year and has uh, for a long time. And what she described is a military government in Egypt, albeit financed by Saudi money so that they could say no to the Pentagon uh, uh, 1.3 billion or whatever it was, because they had far more from uh, the Saudis. They are also seeking uh, alliances with Russia. They're seeking alliances and, and purchases from, from China uh, to rebuild Egypt after the Muslim Brotherhood left the country in absolute ruin with their fanaticism once they got control of the country under Morsi. So uh, there are fascinating things going on uh, in the entirety of the Middle East, and they're going to have shockwaves into uh, Eurasia, into Western Europe, into uh, Africa, as well as into certainly North America. Well, I have already monopolized your time for a full hour, so I won't keep you much longer. But just on that final note, you did bring up the uh, the issue of China, for example, and it, the the way it is cur currently increasing its influence around the globe. And, uh, and part of that, of course, is just its need for physical resources as it continues to expand. And part of that was what we saw late last year with China becoming the world's largest importer of oil, surpassing the United States with projections that by 2020 it will reach 70% of uh, total demand, world demand. That's a staggering sum, and obviously that brings with it a certain amount of geopolitical clout and a certain amount of clout for the renminbi, for the Chinese yuan, if they do start to move towards convertibility and to start to, to make it into more of an international currency. Um, what is your take on China's role in this, and do, do they have geopolitical weight to throw around at this point, or are they simply storing it up? Uh, both. They, they have enormous geopolitical weight. They're a very, very careful culture. I've been to China now 10 times uh, since spring of 2008 and talked with uh, uh, leading intellectuals, uh, people in government, people in government think tanks, uh, ministries, and so forth, uh, both on the petroleum question and on the question of strategic geopolitics. I, I a year ago, authored a book called uh, in English, it's called Target China. It will be out in English in uh, uh, the next three months. But I, in that book, uh, which was released in Beijing uh, world premiere a year ago, I outlined all of the potential Western threats to make sure that China does what it's told to do in the future, not only the vulnerability of its oil supply lines, but uh, things like GMO, the introduction of, of uh, massive amounts of Monsanto GMO seeds into the Chinese agriculture, which up until recently had been one of the highest quality uh, 
food sources on the planet. The Chinese food culture is light years ahead of that in Western Europe or, or the United States. I can tell from personal experience. But uh, the Chinese are extremely cautious. They don't react. Uh, they don't shoot from the hip. Uh, or they certainly have not been shooting from the hip on this question of the uh, island dispute in the East China Sea with Japan, even though the Abe government has certainly been shooting from the hip in all directions uh, against China to try to provoke, try to uh, goad them into making a mistake and overreacting. Uh, they are aware of this. What they're trying to do is not just uh, secure the raw materials. That was the agenda in the previous 10 years. They're trying now to build new markets for Chinese exports, Chinese trade, through Eurasia, the Eurasian continent. And people who know the book, The Grand Chessboard of Zbigniew Brzezinski from 1997, <coughs> excuse me, Brzezinski then made clear that the sole potential challenger in the world for a United States sole superpower hegemony was the combined nations of Eurasia. That includes Russia and China and the various stand countries they're called in between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and so forth. And that Eurasian land space, this goes back to Sir Alfred Mackinder and his uh, 1919 book uh, in the context of the Versailles peace talks, where the nation that can, who controls Central Europe, meaning Germany, Poland, uh, and so forth, can control uh, the heartland, which for Mackinder was either Russia, the Russian Empire, or uh, China. Uh, he said this years later. And who controls the heartland controls the world island. Well, the world island is the land space that uh, draws together Western Europe, uh, Asia, Eurasia, European Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And who controls the world island, uh, Mackinder said, controls the world. British geopolitics since 1904 has been to prevent that uh, coming together of Eurasia. And Brzezinski says openly in 1997, seven years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that remains America's central foreign policy, geopolicy today, to prevent that. So uh, uh, this is a fascinating time. The Chinese uh, president, the new President Xi, announced the formation of a Silk Road, a, a rail and transportation and pipeline corridor going through Central Asia. This was a year ago. They're making major investment projects as I was in Beijing just last week. They finalized with the government of Pakistan, a neighbor of China, and a longtime cooperation partner of sorts, uh, up until the 9-11 events, uh, to build a transportation corridor down to the, uh, yeah, the port of Guadar, uh, and also similar transportation corridor through Myanmar to make more secure the energy pipeline flows of, of China in the future going directly into Xinjiang. And, and wouldn't you know it, there's uh, so there's some independent uh, groups there that are tr threatening the, uh, the the Pakistani government and trying to uh, secede and they're being supported by American congressmen who are so they're so caring. They love those people so much. That's why they're involved. Baluchistan, in Baluchistan are such wonderful people that, uh, like the Tibetan people, they have to be supported uh, over and above the uh, Chinese government or the Pakistani government. And these are jihadist groups that are being uh, recycled in there from, uh, and also their, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, intelligence uh, operations are, are involved in taking Uyghurs, uh, ethnic people from Xinjiang province in the far western part of, on the border to Pakistan for this uh, transportation corridor. That's where most of the uh, internal oil and gas uh, reserves of China are known to exist, and the pipelines from Kazakhstan and Russia flow through uh, Xinjiang province. So they have been taking Uyghurs, bringing them to Turkey, in something uh, Sybil Edmonds alerted me to, uh, and training them. Uh, they come into to Turkey as normal, uh, peaceful, ordinary Muslim university students, but there they get picked up by the uh, Fethullah Gulen uh, cadre, 
pulled out and uh, transformed through various means uh, into jihadi warriors and sent to Syria, among other things, in the last couple of years, where they get combat experience. Then they're recycled back into China and given a mission to uh, essentially wage jihad in uh, 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 in China, inside China, and everything in between. Yes. So well, it's a, we, we have just about covered the entire globe. So I think I think we'll wrap it up here because again, we could talk about this for hundreds of hours, and I will let you go. But, but up, uh, maybe in six months we can do a, a rerun if you're interested. In oh, talk I was about just it. about to say I'm not going to let you go until we agree to uh, talk again because I think it's been two and a half years since our last conversation, which is much too long. All right, William Engdahl, williamengdahl.com, an absolutely vital uh, a, a resource of articles on all of these geopolitical events that we're talking about. I hope people will go there and check out that website and uh, purchase the books because, again, um, some really important insights coming from williamengdahl.com on a regular basis. So, William Engdahl, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, James.